even death itself could stop Jesus. He finished his work on the cross, but he had only just began building his church. Today, he is still calling out to the weary, the broken, and the lost. He is still healing, changing lives, and resurrecting dead hearts. For anyone who desires to come after him, for anyone who will deny themselves and take up their cross daily, for anyone who will lose their life for his sake, they will still find life. They will still be made new. They will become Jesus followers. Yeah, amen, amen. It's good stuff. Hey, I hope you have gone to see the movie Jesus Revolution. It's so good. If you haven't, you should go. It's going to go out of theater soon. I know that probably means it'll end up on Amazon or somewhere like that, but it's cool to see in the theater because when Heather and I went, there were other uh, believers in the room, so there was just this spirit of joy watching it, and uh, man, our young people are going to watch it today. You'll hear more about that a little later, so cool. All right, so we're in our series, Jesus Follower, and we're, we're walking along the path of what it means to be a Jesus follower, and the you know, the beautiful thing that about the gospel and about Jesus is that he didn't invite us to just something religious. He didn't invite us to just add church to our life. He came to deal with the very specific areas of our life. He didn't just die for sin in general. He came to die for the areas in your life and my life where we had failed. Those places where you blew it. Those places where you've been the most selfish, those places where you have failed the most, Jesus died for that. And this is where the beauty of the gospel comes alive because Jesus is drawn to those spots in our life. Not so that he can come over and whack you on the head with the hammer of judgment, but so that he can come into that place in your life where you have tried to hide, where you have felt guilt, where you have been in shame, and he comes to wash and to heal and to make us new in that spot. Amen? And that's the beauty of this gospel. He comes and he gives grace. He comes and he gives healing. He doesn't ignore those places. He doesn't just overlook those places. He comes right to them and touches them so that they can be made new and clean in us. The New Testament affirms this whole truth in the book of Romans with this verse from chapter five. It says, where sin abounded in the exact spot that it happened and it was gross and it was ugly and you did that thing and you did those things and you said those things and you had that heart attitude in that place where that happened, where it abounded, where it was festering, where it was gross, grace abounded much more in that spot. In that very specific spot. I got a scratch in my eye. I got an eyelash or something in here. So, yeah, that's not an illustration. It just really happened. So, where sin abounded, grace abounds all the more. In other words, he comes in to love us, heal us, forgive us with grace that is greater than the sin. You didn't get the judgment you deserved. That's mercy. You got the blessing you didn't deserve. He didn't not just judge you. He gifted you as well. That's mercy and that's grace. He comes in and he does more than we thought. So in that place in your own life where you have a history where there has been selfishness, greed, lust, brokenness, anger, bitterness, resentment, a lack of forgiveness, where there has been extreme hurt, where there has been rejection, where there has been fear, where there has been anxiety, in that spot, Jesus is drawn to heal us and give us grace. That's what makes the beauty of the gospel so great. That's what makes Jesus so wonderful. And this is what he does. 
He comes to pour out grace and he actually comes to restore the things that were lost in that place. The years that you lost, the relationships that you lost, the parts of your emotions in your mind that were lost, the habits that caused such devastation. Jesus comes not just to heal that, but to restore what was lost. So in a marriage where there have been years maybe of disconnect, coldness, no affection, no desire, maybe even the thought, this is never going to work. Jesus comes into that spot right there. And when we soften our hearts, he heals and he restores and he makes it into something greater than what the years had taken. Amen? Even from what the enemy had taken, he restores and puts more on top of it. Uh, the book of Joel in the Old Testament says it this way. God promises, he says, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust have eaten. Now, this is a very visual, physical image in Joel's day <clears throat> because they were well aware of swarming locusts coming in and destroying what would have been a harvest, taking away perhaps years of grain and feed for them. And God said to them, if you'll return to me, I can not only heal your land, but I can restore to you what years of the swarming locust have eaten. This is our hope in the gospel, is that no matter what has happened in the past, Jesus comes along to replace and restore in greater quantity and quality what was lost. So, our message today is called Followers Embrace Restoration. Because this is what Jesus does for us. It becomes our heartbeat. It becomes our passion. Because he restores in us, it causes us to be all of a sudden alive to the whole idea of restoration. We like it all of a sudden. We want to be a part of it. We want to see God restore in us, but we also want to see things restored that we have broken, that we have caused pain in someone else's life. We want to be a part of restoring that because God does this new work in us. And this is what Jesus' followers do. We begin the process of restoring things that even we have caused the pain of in other people. Let me show you our Bible verses for this week. Take a picture of the screen if you'd like. Uh, your phone is a welcome addition to the service here today with your camera and uh, Bible app if that's what you use. These will help you walk right along with the message today. You can find these on social media and our app as well. So let's talk about um, what this looks like then for us as Jesus followers and this idea of restoration. This is so important to followers of Jesus. It was important to Jesus as well because he stepped into a world that was filled with religious people, but they had mastered the art of separating their religion from their reality. They had become masters of going to worship services and activities but not living that out in their life. There was a great separation. There was a grand canyon between their faith and their life. And Jesus came with this revolutionary concept that called people to live out their faith in their life, in the very personal, relational areas of life. And this, this idea of relationship, restoration, was so important to Jesus that he said this in the Gospels. Matthew 5, Jesus said this. He says, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, if you are in the process of going to worship God, 
If you were going to the place where you are going to bring your all to God, you're going to have this moment for you and God. He said, if you are in the process of bringing your gift to the altar and there, when you get there, in that moment, when you're about to enter into God's presence, you're about to do your worship and your service for the Lord, and there you remember that your brother has something against you. If you get to that spot where you've come to stand before God and all of a sudden in your mind, in your heart, flashes a picture of someone you know. Not just in general, but someone specific. And there you remember, ooh, I did say that thing to them. I did say that thing about them. I did do that thing to them. I hurt them. I took from them. I caused them pain. He says, if that is what happens, if you were in the midst of bringing your worship to God and you remember what you did to hurt someone else. Now, I want to to be clear here. There are people that are going to be offended by the gospel today, right? I can't go, nor should I, and apologize for everybody that is offended by the gospel. That's not our call. Are we clear? But if I have done something that I know was hurtful, intentional or not, if I have done something to hurt someone else and it's responsibly lies at my door, then here's what Jesus says next. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. You should stop what you're doing in that moment, and you should go. Go ahead, leave your gift there, just leave it, and go your way. And Jesus says this next. First, be reconciled to your brother. Then, come and offer your gift. Jesus says, I'm, I've got a radical, radically different way of life I talk about that I am calling followers to. I'm not calling followers to a disconnected religious from reality life. I'm calling people to follow me where faith and life walk hand in hand. Where mercy comes from heaven and mercy comes from my heart. Where grace comes from heaven and grace comes from my life to other people. So much so that being at a place where someone else is hurt because of me becomes something that's a priority to me. And I do what I must to go and make things right. Because this is what heaven does. Heaven restores. And Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, then you need to be the kind of man and woman who will seek to reconcile with a believer or an unbeliever if you have been the one to cause pain in their life and the responsibility lies at your door. He says you should seek to reconcile, make things right with them before you even finish your worship, before you finish your serving, before you go any further. This, he says, is priority. First, be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Now, again, and just introduces a lot of questions. Well, what if they were the ones who started the whole thing? This is not about what they did. This is about what I did. This is not about what they said first, what they did next. Their, their mouth was louder. Their sin was greater. This has nothing to do with them. 
It doesn't say, first, go and tell your brother everything they did wrong to you. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, first, defend yourself, explain yourself, and point your finger back at them harder than they pointed at you. It doesn't say any of that. This is a kind of humility as a Jesus follower that says, I want to be clear before God and I want to be clear before those around me. I don't want to be a stumbling block. I don't want to be an offense to someone. I don't want to be the reason that they are not following Jesus. Yes? With me? The New Testament, again, says this over and over again. In fact, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, now... All things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry or the calling of reconciliation. So you and I, we've been brought to God through Jesus. And he says, now what we do is we become those who help others be reconciled to God through Jesus but also we have this ministry calling service drive to see others reconciled to us when we have been the root of the problem. We don't just ignore that what we've done, we are honest, we acknowledge it, and we go into the very specific areas that we have caused offense and we seek to reconcile. Now this becomes a beautiful thing whenever we do this. Paul Paul points this out in this passage here. The New Testament affirms it. Jesus talked about it. That this actually does become our ministry as it says here. People ask, well, I'm just waiting for God to give me my ministry. Is my ministry working with children? Might be. Is my ministry serving in hospitality here? Might be. Is my ministry being a Bible study group leader? Might be. Is my ministry uh, being a light on social media? Might be. But here is the ministry every one of us have. We are all called to. In the very specific places that you have caused pain And someone else can look at you and say, you hurt me. That we, as our ministry, should seek to go and be reconciled to them as much as is possible within us. Mm. Because all of us have people that we've hurt in our lives, right? Right? It's getting real personal and a little bit uncomfortable this morning, right? We can just acknowledge that and just kind of be okay this morning. This is what the Holy Spirit does. This is what Jesus' followers do. We allow him to walk all up into the very personal, private parts of our life, right? And this is what he's doing right now. Because we all have people that we have hurt in our past. In fact, most likely, one of them is sitting next to you this morning. Right? Just acknowledge all of this stuff, right? So this becomes now what I live to do. I don't want to be a cause for someone else's pain. I don't want to be a stumbling block for someone else. I want to reconcile because Jesus said, first, be reconciled to your brother before you even come to worship, before you bring your gift to the altar. So this becomes our ministry. This is who we are. We are a people of reconciliation. Another part of the New Testament would say we are ambassadors for Christ. And we have this calling for this purpose. We become experts at knowing how to make things right. We become those who are passionate to see that restoration happens. Sometimes as Christians, we like to be known for what we stand for. I like that. 
But the New Testament says we ought to be known for how we restore people, how we reconcile people, and how we practice that in our homes, in our marriages, and with our children, and with our church family, and with our friends. This becomes what we are good at. This becomes what we are called to. This becomes what every one of us have as God's calling upon us. And we do this out of a genuine desire. I don't do it because I'm forced to. I don't do it because God's got a hammer over my head if I don't. I do it out of genuine desire because this is what Jesus' followers do and this is what he did for me. And so I want to do that for others. Are we all together on this so far? Let's talk about how we do that then. What does that look like in life? How do we seek to be reconciled with those that we have caused pain in? That the responsibility lies at our door. Here are four ways today we're gonna talk about how we do that. The first three, I'm gonna move somewhat quickly through so that I can get to the fourth one. The first three, you've probably heard about if you've been around church. The fourth one, maybe not so much. The first three, you might have done. The fourth one, not many people do. But the fourth one is perhaps the most important one. The first thing we do today, if you're gonna be skilled and active in your ministry of reconciling, is this. You have to be at a place where you forgive and release those who have hurt you. You can't go and restore a relationship with someone else if you're carrying around some suitcases full of pain and resentment and bitterness. Because what happens is, if you are so caught up in what everybody else has done to you, they said this about you, They did this thing to you, and you carry the weight of that. You carry all of the pain of that, and you just keep replaying the DVD of it. You just keep hitting the reverse and just and play it one more time. Just to remember, here's what they said to me. Here's what they did to me. I'm going to hear that one more time. You just want to keep it there in the fresh in the front of your mind and your heart. If that's how you live, here's what happens to all of us. If you keep replaying everybody else's faults and hurts that they've done to you. You will look like the victim all the time and everybody else will be the one who has brought the pain. And when you have a victim mentality, everybody is at fault. Am I right? And so the first thing you and I have to do if we want to be good at restoration and reconciliation with others is we have to be at the place where we forgive those who have hurt us. We have to release them. This is what Jesus did for you. And you say, well, they hadn't asked me to forgive them. Yet you hadn't either when Jesus died for you. He did it while you and I were still sinning against him. So if you want to get down this road and be all that Jesus has called us to be, the first thing you have to do is forgive those who have hurt you. If that means making a list, just so you can see it one last time, and then consciously, intentionally working through it and forgiving them and releasing them from having to pay you back then you can get to the place where you truly forgive them and your heart can be free. Because you can't begin restoring relationship with others when you're the victim of everybody else's pain. Are we together? The second thing that we must do is this. We must seek forgiveness. Now here's what's going to happen. The minute you forgive those around you and release them 
from all that they did to you because this is what Jesus did for us, then all of a sudden, I know it's going to come rushing to your mind because it happens to me. The minute I release them, I'm going to become aware of now what I did. It's funny how this works. As long as I'm holding you prisoner for what you did to me, I don't see what I did to hurt you. But the minute I let you go, I can see all of a sudden. And this becomes the moment where we now go to those who have hurt us or that we have hurt and say, would you forgive me for what I said? I was wrong. I heard a message recently from a pastor and he was explaining this process in detail and he brought out this point that I thought was just brilliant. Probably because I just resonate with this so much. Whenever I want to say I am wrong, I usually want to follow it with a couple of other sentences. I was wrong. But what I was really trying to say is, right? I was wrong. But it was because the other day you did this thing. You know, everybody know what I'm talking about, right? It's so easy and natural to want to, uh, I was wrong. But you... And real forgiveness, asking forgiveness says, I was wrong, period. Would you forgive me? And don't go all hyper-spiritual and saying, well, you have to forgive me right now. You have to, you have to. The Bible says you have to. You've just gone into being offensive again, really, at this point. You can't force someone else to forgive you. The thing you do is you just say, I was wrong. Would you forgive me? And then shut your mouth and walk away and wait for them. Let them process and work out if they want to forgive you. The third thing is this. Now reconcile. This gets tricky because I know what's, what you're already asking in your head because I ask it. So if someone hurt me and there's a whole history of them hurting me, I'm supposed to forgive them and now I'm supposed to reconcile with them and become best buddies with them. We're supposed to go out and get coffee. We're supposed to go hang out together. We're supposed to all get together all the time like none of that ever happened. Were you thinking that, right? That's usually the question people say, well, does that mean I have to become best friends with them? No, it does not. There are some people that you're not going to be able to reconcile with for whatever reason. They may have moved on. They may have moved on to heaven. They may not be interested. But you do what you can to seek to reconcile. Now, the people closest to us, we do. We seek to rebuild to a better place than we had been. In fact, the word reconciliation means to move into a place of favor where that person who hurt you and you've been so angry about and mad at and hurt by, you release your resentment and bitterness and you forgive them you ask forgiveness for what you did, and then you begin to build this relationship again to a place of trust, to a place, place of healing, to a place of greater communication than it has been before. And that takes time. Now, all three of these so, so far, I told you I was gonna move through rather quickly. Any one of them, you could just about make a series off of on Sunday mornings, right? Because I'm sure they're just like, questions clicking through your mind. There is for me. But I want us to move into the fourth one because it's really where not a lot of time is spent and not a lot of emphasis is given. And it is on 
taking action to restore a relationship. It's different than reconcile. Reconcile puts two people back into the room. Reconcile both agrees on forgiveness. Reconcile can shake hands or hug and be good with one another. But restoration, that's different. Restoration is a completely different process. It's not just asking forgiveness. It's not just seeking forgiveness. It's not just reconciling. It is an intentional act that attempts to replace whatever we broke or stole from this other person. Now, we understand this in the physical realm. If you went to a friend's house, and while you were there, you bumped into a table, and something fell off the table, and it broke. You would say, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Can I replace that for you? They would probably be gracious. Oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But you would want to restore the thing that had been lost, right? You would want to give back for what you did. That makes sense to us in the physical realm. It ought to make sense to us in the spiritual relational realm as well. Because if you and I have done something to someone by our words, by our action, by a lack of words or lack of action and caused pain, caused brokenness, caused harm, in any way, then you and I should have the heart within us, the heart of Jesus that says, I want to restore that which was lost. I want to replace that. Now, the stunning power of the gospel is that we were the ones who had done wrong against Jesus and Jesus chooses to restore us It's usually the offender that does the restoration, but Jesus restored for us. So it ought to be something sensible for us to say, oh my, I all of a sudden realize what I have done to my spouse, to my child, to my parent, to my neighbor, to my friend. And now I want to make things right not just so we can both look each other in the eye in the room, but I want to do what Jesus does. And I want to restore more than what I took. The Old Testament has this same principle woven throughout it. In the law, contained in the law, God prescribed this truth. Look at Exodus 22. Here it is. The law said, if a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. In other words, if a man takes it from another person, he takes their ox or he takes their sheep and he takes it so that he can't replace it and he takes it and slaughters it then what he should do, this was by the Old Testament law, God's law for his people, how they were to relate to one another. He should restore what he took and depend upon what it was, it should be either four or five times what he took. This was in the law. Now, what's fascinating is the world in general understands this. If you were to Google this week, how many positive words does it take to replace a negative word? The world understands this. If I say one negative thing to somebody and I want to restore the relationship, how many positive words do I have to say to them to restore it? And depending upon which site you go to, it'll either say three, four, five, or seven. And the Bible affirms every one of those numbers. Two of them right here in this verse. If you have done something to someone 
the goal for restoring ought to be to replace it with even more of what you stole, broke, or used for your own selfish purposes. Now, it's interesting, the Old Testament also affirmed that this was the way that you rehabilitate people who commit crimes. Watch this. In our world today, if people commit a crime and they're found guilty, they go to a prison, or another word for that is a penitentiary, right? It comes from the word penitent. These penitentiaries were made originally to help people sit in time alone and consider the weight of what they've done, their sin. And as a result of that, make things right. You think that system's working? Is it? It's not. Because God had a very different way of dealing with people who committed crimes. It's right here in this verse. If you take something from someone, it doesn't say go sit alone in a prison cell thinking about what you've done. What you ought to do is repay them four or five times what you took for them from them. This will rehabilitate somebody. This is the process God had for his people. And this is what's necessary for us when it comes to relationships. If you want to see restoration take place, you can't just say, I'm sorry. I forgive you. Would you forgive me? That's great. But there is a piece that is often missing, and it is this piece of restoring. So it might be that God brings something to your mind. You think, oh my goodness, I have, I have been so harsh with my spouse, with my words. If the Holy Spirit reveals that to you, that's awesome. You should ask forgiveness for that. But then begin the process of restoring what has been lost. If you want to see healing take place, you want to see God do a work, then restore more than what you stole, what you took. Again, the Bible is filled with this principle, but if you're not looking for it, you might miss it. But it happens in the Gospels as well to a man named Zacchaeus. Look at Luke 19. Zacchaeus was, uh, the Bible says, a, a man of shorter statue. And uh, he worked as a tax uh, collector gatherer. He actually had become very wealthy at it because he was cheating people while he was collecting from them. He was self-serving. He was saying, oh, well, here's how much you, oh, wait a minute. He'd add a little bit to how much they owed because then he would keep it for himself. He would use his authority to cheat everybody else out of their riches. And he became rich himself at everybody else's expense. And one day, he hears about this man, Jesus, coming to town. And Zacchaeus climbs up in a tree to go see him because he can't see above all the crowd. And Zacchaeus sees him and Jesus sees Zacchaeus. And Jesus says, I'm coming to your house today, Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus says, come on down. And Jesus says, no, you come on down. And so they go to his house. And while they are there, the Bible says that there are other people around and they are, they're kind of accusing him and saying, I can't believe this guy is here. And Jesus would associate with this man. And here's what the Bible says, that Zacchaeus stood. He stood up there in his own home to make this statement. He said, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. He said, I, I became wealthy at other people's expense. And so now... I'm going to give half of what I have to the poor. Awesome. Zacchaeus goes on and he says, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, here it is, I restore fourfold. I will restore to them four times what I took from them. 
This is restoration. You see what I'm saying? This isn't talked about a whole lot. Reconciliation, be able to look each other in the eye. Cool. Restoration, this is a different truth. That this is what Jesus followers have a heart to do. And can you imagine a marriage relationship where one or both are able to be honest, vulnerable, and humble enough to admit they fail. And to be very specific and say, I have failed you by speaking harshly to you. Now, I will begin the process of restoring what I have taken. And you choose by your words, by your actions, to restore to them in encouragement and words of affirmation and compliments and praise. That's just one example. And then you start thinking through other places that you might have caused pain in other people's lives and say, God, I want to have, as you've given me, the ministry of reconciliation and restoring. So show me, Lord, and I will go and restore that which has been lost. Can you imagine the power of even just the number of people that are here this morning? If we all said, God, I want the gospel to be seen in my life. I don't want anyone to stumble because of what I've said and done. So I will seek forgiveness for what I've done to reconcile where I can and restore what I have taken. This becomes powerful. This is proof that you really are a Jesus follower. Because here's what Jesus said to Zacchaeus next. That Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house. This house has been changed because this man's been changed. He's not working his way off to try to get to heaven. He's been changed inside and now he's showing the gospel to everybody he knows. Everyone that he has hurt, taken from, used for his own selfish purposes. Zacchaeus was a genuine Jesus follower. And this is what he invites us to. Now, I know this is a weighty subject. This is something that every one of us have to really begin to take in. Say, okay, Lord, I don't want to walk back through a trip of condemnation in my mind, but I want to walk back through and you help me know how can I go give fourfold back to the places that I've caused pain? How can I give life where I cause death? How can I speak hope where I spoke so damaging words? And if that be in my marriage or my family, my work friends, whoever, God, may that be me. Because this is where ministry comes from. This is where the gospel comes alive. Would you bow your heads this morning? I would ask you to ask the Lord, God, where does this message apply to me? Who is waiting to hear from me? Who needs to know that I have failed and to restore and to see the beauty of the gospel lived out? Would you ask God that? He's ready to give you the grace to do all that he puts in your heart and mind. He's ready to give you everything that you need, like Zacchaeus, to go and make things right. Father, I thank you for truth that comes in to free us in the very specific areas of our sin. But then that same truth call us to free others where we have sinned against them. So God, I'd ask you to speak to each one of us today. Help us know where we have caused pain. Help us to have the words, the sensitivity, and the timing to go and reconcile. 
and even perhaps more importantly, to begin restoring what was lost, to replace where we sinned against someone by now giving great grace. It's what you've done for us. It's what you call us to do for others. This is what it means to follow you. So Father, I pray you would speak. Fill us with the same spirit of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.